much me. I think uh, pretty much everybody knows who I am, actually. I'm so I'm David. <laughs> <laughs> oh, maybe you're laughing yeah. because you don't. So that's <laughs> understandable. Um, and I, of course, run the Centre for American Art here at the Courtauld. As you know, the Centre exists to support research and teaching in American art, broadly defined of all periods, from the colonial to the contemporary, and in the widest geographical and transnational contexts. We're fortunate to be generously funded uh, by the Terra Foundation for American Art, uh, for which we are uh, always grateful. The Centre puts on many events, conferences and lectures throughout the academic year, and to deliver our final uh, lecture in the Research Forum Seminar Series uh, in 2018-2019, I'm delighted to introduce tonight's speaker. Professor Gail Levin is Distinguished Professor of 20th Century and Contemporary Art at the Graduate Centre at the City University of New York. Gail Levin's research interests are interdisciplinary and include American studies, women's studies and Jewish studies, all with a focus on interactions between life and art. Her published work includes major biographies of Edward Hopper, 1995, Lee Krasner, 2011, and Judy Chicago, 2007, as well as cultural history, Aaron Copeland's America, which was published in 2000, and essays on the theory of biography um, and on uh, the areas in which she works. Inscribing erased women artists into history motivates much of her current work. Her research on Edward Hopper and Marsden Hartley led her to co-found the catalogue Raisonnet Scholars Association. And for, Hop her, for Hopper, she published the catalogue Raisonnet in 1995. And the catalogue Raisonnet of Marsden Hartley is one of her ongoing projects. Professor Levin has served as a curator at the Whitney Museum of American Art and as guest curator at the Museum of Modern Art and other venues. Funding for her research has come from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Fulbright Association, the Pollock Krasner Stony Brook Foundation, and the Rockefeller Foundation, among many other sources. Her 1995 biography of Hopper won the School Library Journal Best American Biography, was a Los Angeles Times Book Prize finalist, a New York Times Notable Book of the Year, and in 2007 was singled out as one of the five best artist biographies ever by the Wall Street Journal. Also in 2007, uh, Professor Levin received from the National Association of Women Artists their award for biography and art history. Her writing has been translated and published internationally in 19 countries, and she's been honoured in many ways, including uh, an honorary doctorate from Simmons University in Boston. The subject tonight, making art, making trouble, and making do in the 1930s. Um, okay, Professor Gale Um, questions were and her answers. 
So she was very respectful of um, this kid that I was, and she could never have imagined that I would end up five years, six years hence, six years hence, a curator at the Whitney Museum, able to put her work in a show with, as the only woman, the first generation abstract expressionist with her male contemporaries. Um, and that changed the trajectory somewhat of her critical reception. Uh, it was very positively re received. And it also traveled to Tokyo. So just quickly, because I want to emphasize the 30s, and if any of you are planning to come at 8 o'clock on Thursday to my lecture at the Barbican, it won't cover any of this territory. The exhibition basically almost starts where I leave off tonight. Um, so this is the background for that. With a few exceptions, the self-portraits will be in the show. And, and I have some other little images. Maybe at the end. Maybe not. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so I just want you to see if um, right here in what is today Ukraine and was then the Russian Empire, that's where her parents <laughs> immigrated from, and they landed in Brooklyn, first in Brownsville, and then moved to East New York. The reason they came were pogroms, government orchestrated attacks against Jews, the minority in the Russian Empire. This is a photograph, and notice the, um, the background, which is a landscape painting of nature, probably the first one we ever knew because they have the photograph at home. This, this is her parents um, with her siblings who are uh, Russian Empire born. She wasn't in the picture yet. She and her younger sister, Ruth, weren't born. They, they were born in Brooklyn. And the father typically came ahead of the rest of the family with the elder son, uh, Lee's brother Irving, to keep him out of the czar's draft for Jews, which he lost. Um, from 12 years for 25, 12 years of age for 25 years. In 2010, um, I went to Ukraine to Shpikov, to the hometown of uh, the Krasner family. It was spelled with two S's then, she changed it later. And I visited the shtetl. There was still a Jewish family living there, or at least half Jewish. And um, there was still maintained a Jewish cemetery. And as the crow flies, I visited my own great-grandparents' shtetl. Um, and there wasn't much left except um, uh, geese walking down the street. And so Schmick, and no, in, no indoor plumbing. So Schmickop was a lot uh, more depressed. Her family came from a lot fancier than where my great-grandparents came from. But um, perhaps I viewed Lee a little bit like my grandmother. She seemed very friendly when I met her. She seemed like an old lady. She was in her early 60s, I think. Uh, when you're in your early 20s, that seems really old. It doesn't seem so old anymore. But um, here's the only photo, really, of Lee as a very um, fairly young child in Brooklyn with her sister Ruth. About 1916. She was born Alina, that's her name that she's going to change. And she wasn't yet called Lee, but this is um, her elementary school class. And she remembered her um, favorite teacher, Mr. Walrath. She liked him because I think he let the boys on the, and girls play on the same softball team. She liked equality from the earliest years. She wanted to sit in the synagogue with her father, not in the women's balcony, for which Orthodox Jews required, or women's section. And by the way, everything Lee told me, pretty much I could check out. As a biographer, I go back to primary sources. And I was able to find Mr. Walrath, for example, with just that little clue. 
And the reason I wrote the biography of Lee Krasner, if you look at my biography, at the back there's a note on sources, because the Jackson Pollock biography that won the Pulitzer Prize has a lot of uh, invented material in it. And it's very unfair to Lee Krasner. And I was, I will say, it, outraged. Among other things, it puts direct quotations from a fiction novel. Oh, novels are fiction. Biographies are not supposed to be. They put those words into Krasner's mouth. And you have to read in the footnotes in nine point type to see that they were adapted um, from a novel. I interviewed Bob Friedman, whom I knew as a novelist. He was also Pollock's first biographer, not uh, this one in question. And he was adamant that the couple in his book, uh, photographer and his non artist wife, were completely his inventions, not based on Krasner and Pollock at all. And when I had read that dialogue, I knew Krasner never spoke like that, nor would have said those things. So you get this book. <laughs> uh, and by the way, other subsequent biographers have used that book as a source. And as an art historian, I I write the genre of biography, which isn't fully accepted by our historians. And if I think about it, I see why, because so many are written by non-art historians with invented material. So it's not history, it's fiction. But mine might be a little tougher reading, but you can rely that everything I say goes back to a primary document. So here you see photo previously unpublished of Lee Krasner with her mother and her sister, uh, older sister Rose, and her two nieces. And I was able to interview one of those two nieces. And by now, Lee is in high school, and she's changed her name from Lena to Lenore. And she took the name Lenore, I'm quite sure, I put two and two together from Edgar Allan Poe, whom she told me she loved to read in high school. And so did my father, actually born just four years after Lee. And um, so that's what American high school students were reading and memorizing. And of course, the Raven and the other Poe poems um, specifically um, speak about Lenore. Lee went to a high school, the only one, um, Washington Irving in Manhattan. It took her two tries to get in there, uh, where you could major in art. <coughs> and then from there, she got a portfolio together and got accepted into Cooper Union, an art school for all women that was free. Now, they had an engineering school at night for men, but the day students in the art school were then all women. So you can read in another book that Lee Krasner took the name Lee to pretend uh, to pretend she had male identity, but it's just not true. Her fellow women students, and this is in the newspaper, uh, the school newspaper from Cooper Union at the time, many entries about Lee Krasner from the other girls. And they talk about her curly eyelashes and wearing her hair up. And it's clearly not about a male identity. Now, later on, if she signed Lee or LK, in fact, when she had her first retrospective, which was here in London at Whitechapel, organized by Brian Robertson in 1965. <clears throat> Um, at that time, it's true that some of the press in London thought Lee Crescent was a man, but the press was very positive, so who cares? <laughs> well, by the time Lee was um, at Cooper Union, she had this Mr. Hinton, Charles Hinton, for um, anatomy or drawing from cast of anatomy. They didn't have 
athletic models in this class, and he did not like Lee's work. He considered her too messy, and you can almost imagine messy would lead to being an abstract expressionist. <laughs> but um, when she moves on to the National Academy of Design because she wants to be a fine artist, and Cooper Union stressed, actually it was filled with immigrant Jewish girls. It was almost all Jewish. It was supported by um, the high society, WASPI, what we call white Anglo-Saxon Protestant women, uh, as kind of a charity. And um, the training at Cooper Union at that time was aimed at creating people to go into the garment industry, women, uh, or the decorative arts, uh, interior design, illustration, not the fine arts. So Lee was really motivated, for whatever reason, to become a fine artist. So she gets the idea that she needs to go to the National Academy of Design. And so that's the kind of cast gallery she had to work with. By the way, though, before she went to the National Academy of Design, she had another professor at Cooper Union, Victor Perard, and she told me, we used to talk a lot, um, she told me about Victor Perard, and even in the 70s, before there was an internet, she told me she had uh, been paid her first earnings as an artist were a few dollars to do a page of illustrations. The one you see on the right of the hand, kind of cubistically looking. And um, she didn't have a copy of it. So I went out um, to use bookshops and found her a copy, which I inscribed to her when she kept it, which is today in her collection of Polly Kresner House. So in order to get into the National Academy of Design and to get into the life classes there, she had to do a self-portrait from life. And her parents, um, who worked as fishmongers, very difficult. You know, they had to drive their horse and buggy to Manhattan to the fish market on South Street, load it up with fish and ice, and drive it back to Brooklyn and sell the fish before it melted. So eventually, they wanted to retire from this grueling work and have a little farm, a little garden anyway. And they moved out to um, Long Island, <coughs> to Huntington. And that's where Lee went um, in the summer of 1928 to work on her self-portrait from life. And you can see she loved nature. She paints herself. Um, in the woods or in, in the yard, as it were. And she said, I um, nailed a mirror to a tree and spent the summer painting myself. It was difficult, the light in the mirror, the heat, and the bugs. And we got a lot of mosquitoes all the time. And um, you could see that she's doing something similar to the Van Gogh concept. But the committee at the National Academy accused her of inventing the fact, pretending that she had painted this out of doors. They didn't believe she could do something um, so well out of doors. But she got accepted. She liked to stay on probation. But it turns out that everybody accepted for life drawing was on probation. These are the only extant photographs of her parents and her sister out in Huntington. So she, this is already in the 30s. These are some of her fellow classmates. Um, actually, they're all like her from Russian Jewish origins. Some of them uh, just born to immigrant parents, and some of them actually immigrants. But. Um, if you look at the record cards of the National Academy of Design from this era, and they still exist, um, where it says M and F, male and female, you could read it as M and F, mother and father. And for Krasner, they wrote Russian, even though she's born in Brooklyn. So I think they were keeping track on the number of Russian students at the academy. 
You'll see what that becomes interesting in a second. But um, Byron Brown, Boris Gorlick, and Ilya Volotovsky are three examples. They all made names for themselves, just not as famous as Krasnov would become. But another two of the students, well, as Svigoslava Kina became a pretty famous children's book illustrator, although uh, she also painted abstract paintings, she's not very well known. And she was Jewish from Siberia. And Igor Panchohov, the best male artist in the school, and not Jewish, but Russian immigrant. His family turns out, it was rumored, and I did the research and found his nieces. And the family was very close to the Tsar. The father worked for the Tsar. Um, he was in the Russian military. And of course, after the Bolshevik Revolution, the white Russians had to flee. So his very high society Russian family ended up refugees in New York. And the parents lived at a fancy address on the Central Park West. But when I read the census, I found out that they ran a boarding house. So it wasn't so fancy. But they were very anti-Semitic. And they refused to even meet Lee Krasner. But Igor took a shine to her, and they became a couple. And they stayed together for 10 full years, but never married. Because she wouldn't marry someone whose parents wouldn't even meet her. Another one of the students, Eva Mursky, at the National Academy, painted this portrait of Lee Krasner. Actually, Mursky's father past was Jewish, Russian Jewish past through London, where he became a portrait painter. So um, the Mursky sisters, she had a sister, Kitty, were second generation artists, portraitists even, and noticed that Lee is wearing a cross, which may be a little homage to Igor. But she never gave up her Jewish identity. She wasn't. Um, practicing the Orthodox Judaism of her parents. And this is another portrait by Ida Mursky of Lee Krasner looking very, so these are from the, about 1930, looking, and that's Ida and her sister Kitty. They were both in the cohort of women at the National Academy of Design. Now, while the, why this becomes interesting in the exhibition is this self-portrait of Lee Krasner. I don't know whether she gave it to Ida Mursky or she, Ida Mursky might have purchased it. But they were very good friends. The two of them got into trouble together. Let's see if uh, it's going to come up in a minute. But I'm jumping ahead. But anyway, they got in trouble together and they got suspended. You'll see why in a minute, I think. But it was for painting, well, I'll just tell you, it was for painting a still life in order to paint a still life of fish. They didn't want the fish to spoil, so they put it in the basement so that it would uh, be cooler. And then women weren't allowed in the basement because they suspected the men would, you know, have hanky-pank with the women down there. So if you took still life class and you needed to paint a fish and you were female, you couldn't go in the basement. And Ida and Lee broke the rule and went into the basement and got suspended. And I told you that I could do primary research, so I went to interview Ida. She was the oldest person I interviewed for the biography. She was 99 years old at the time. And she really got exercised of when I reminded her of getting suspended and told me that was the only time she ever got suspended. But she wouldn't, because there was so much prejudice against women students, she wouldn't allow her daughter, uh, Erica, to become a visual artist. So we have Erica John, the feminist novelist and poet, as a result of the male chauvinism in the art world and at the National Academy of Design. So notice that uh, this is 
painted the basement in Brooklyn of the home where uh, the parents' home before they moved. Uh, the, the family still continued to live there in Brooklyn, the various children. And we was living there while she was at the National Academy of Design. And you see the, the light coming in the basement window and the fur, and we always like houseplants. And she's holding a flower of pink. If we look back at this Heinz Midland, holding a pink is an allegory of love, true love. And that's what we felt for Igor at this time. And in a sense, they had a betrothal, this is an image of marriage. And they had an unofficial marriage. It just wasn't legal. And in the exhibition, you see the bottom right portrait and this portrait. And there's at least another one. And note the background, the little hill. It's very Edward Hopper-esque in the one from 31. Now, there were Jewish teachers, Russian Jewish teachers, Ivan Olinsky at the National Academy of Design. And when I looked him up, he um, would pretend not to be Jewish, but some customs or census agents remarked that he was a Hebrew. There was a lot of anti-Semitism. But um, he kind of passed as a, as a Russian, because they were white Russians. And you have to understand that Lee and the Igor's relationship was very um, unusual. This high society, white, czarist, Russian, anti-Semitic family, and this poor Jewish um, immigrant family. Could never have happened in Russia. But anyway, um, Ilya Bolotovsky, and not the Russian student I mentioned before, said we were warned not to follow people like Picasso, Cezanne, because Picasso never learned how to draw, and Cezanne never learned how to paint. And they got other advice like that. Ah. This is what I was looking for. Um, you see a typical National Academy of Design male painted still life by Vitlachil, painted in the basement in 1930. And Lee said that was the first time I experienced real separation as an artist, and it infuriated me. You're not being allowed to paint a fish because you're a woman. It reminded me of being in the synagogue and being told to go up, not downstairs. That kind of thing rivals me, she said, and it still comes up. So we used to talk a lot about discrimination against women and against Jews, two things we both experienced. She gave me a lot of perspective on it. So Igor was a complete charmer. He was so talented. You see his work. And of course, he won the Prix of Rome which is a whole scholarship to go to Europe for a year and study the old masters. Now, Edom Mursky also won a prize, but for women, the prize was not much money. No, just a, a some certificate or something. That's just how it was for women. And you can see that he would like to do female nude models of the attractive variety. <laughs> he was a real lady killer. Now, while this Lee and the Igor and Sabatina and Bolotovsky and all the others were at the National Academy of Design in the, um, in the 20s and the early 30s, MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art, opened in New York for the first time in 1929. And one of the first shows was 19 Living American Painters. It was reviewed by many people, including Forbes Watson, and he attacked all of the artists that weren't American-born, uh, that were ethnics. Um, Kuniyoshi, two Jews, Jules Pascan from Bulgaria, and Max Weber from the Russian Empire, who had been in Paris and even in Picasso's studio. Watson wrote famously that Weber was a Jew, that he was foreign-born. Um, 
and he criticized him for, quote, taking no account of American tradition and for being tied to, quote, European standards. And this criticism would not have been missed by the so Igor goes off to Russia for a year, I'm sorry, to Rome for a year, not Russia, and um, on this scholarship. Lee was known to have had, this is a quote by one of her contemporaries, the kind of animal energy and voluptuousness that we later came to call sex appeal. By the way, that bench on which she's posing kind of model is today at the Pollock Krasner house. Later, when she moved out there, before just before she married Jackson Pollock, which is part of my lecture on Thursday, not tonight, but they drove out it in a um, butcher truck that they borrowed from the brother, brother-in-law of the art critic Harold Rosenberg, old friends of Lee's. So she kept that American cast iron and Bench and her love for American and other antiques, but especially American antiques. So Slava Kina, that rival of Krasner's at the National Academy, made this caricature of Lee, um, a strata fighting cock in 1934. And I interpret this, well, I interpret this as a comment on Lee's um, sexuality. I mean, she was in a relationship with Igor, the most desirable, most accomplished, sexiest man in the school, who drove a fancy convertible. Anyway, he was known to go out and invest in restaurants. And this is in the Great Depression. He didn't have much money, but he had a $100 bill. And the restaurants, could, this is before credit cards, they could never change it, so they often ate for free. <laughs> Well, also the Whitney Museum of American Art opened two years after uh, the Museum of Modern Art, founded by the um, Society sculptor Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney. And they were going to favor younger American artists because they'd already been showing them at the museum's precursor, the Whitney Studio Club. But they showed and acquired when they opened, they showed the work of Edward Hopper, kind of realism not kind of what was known as realism, early Sunday morning from 1930. The, uh, the Metropolitan, this is in the Depression now, and the Metropolitan Museum bought tables for ladies, um, also from 1930. So this is what is succeeding in the New York art world. And the Art Institute of Chicago bought Grant Wood, the regionalist American Gothic <coughs> This is a movement uh, that the artists and their critical supporters um, aggressively opposed European abstract art or modernism um, and demanding. It's not realism. For example, it's more like Cindy Sherman and performance art today because this was really Grant Wood's sister and his friend, the dentist, who were simply posing as a farmer and his wife. So that's what was the status quo. And the critic that was really promoting that was named Thomas Craven. And he wrote this book, came out in 1934 um, on modern art. It says modern art, the men, the movements, the meaning. There were no women, no. <laughs> and in the book, I'm going to quote, on Alfred Stieglitz, the photographer and art dealer, the husband of George O'Keefe. Craven called him, quote, Stieglitz, a Hoboken Jew, that's Hoboken, New Jersey, without knowledge of or interest in the historical American background, was, quite apart from the doses of purified art he had swallowed, hardly equipped for the leadership of genuine American expression. So there you see the bias in that art world that Krasner is trying to enter. How to look at modern art in America by her friend, the um, future abstract expressionist 
at my heart. Excuse me. I'm still suffering from pollen allergies. I blue. Well, PM Magazine was a left-wing political magazine, and this is published later in 1946. But he's commenting on modern art in America, and he included Krasner on the second branch from the left, right next to de Kooning and Warner Dreyfus. So, uh, up there. He still got her as Krasner with two S's, but she was very proud and happy to be included, which is no small feat for a woman artist with all the bites out there. Lee did not forget her friends, so when he died early, she held a wake at her house in East Hampton. So she's going to end up studying um, life drawing at the Greenwich House because that's, she couldn't afford her own model during the Depression and before she goes to study with Hans Hoffman. And that uh, teacher, Joe Goodman, has studied with Thomas Hart Benton, whose work you see here from the 19-teens. It's very much um, sort of modernism, but with a theory that colors could be interpreted based off of Michelangelo's sculpture, if you will, that the planes would be expressed through receding and, and projecting colors. It's called synchronism. Um, a movement invented by two American expatriates, Morgan Russell and Stan McDonald Wright, which was the subject of my first book. Um, you can look it up. But Benton became very well known as one of the regionalists, along with Grant Wood and John Stuart Curry, one of the three most famous. And he did these murals in 1930. He became the teacher at the Art Students League of a young guy named Jackson Pollock, whom we're not going to let much into this lecture. <laughs> but um, this is more Benton's murals, the arts of the West. There's Lee's life drawing, made while in 33, while in the disciple um, Joe Goodman's class at Greenwich House. That's kind of settlement house, so these classes were free. And there's Lee posing around that time. So let's look at her art. This is not in the show, um, perhaps because this is where she's just getting started and she's more derivative. So you can see I have her rooftops, 14th Street from 1934, compared to painting, which was on view in New York just two years earlier at the Frank Wren Gallery. And the art scene was small, so she must have gone there too close otherwise. And it's by Edward Hopper, who is a big star then at both the Metropolitan and at the Whitney. So that's his city roots. And Thomas Hart Benton was originally more liberal and left wing. We see him illustrating for the unemployed in the week for industrial democracy in the early 30s, 30, 32. And the unemployed, there were red lines all around New York. But he wasn't left-wing enough. And he, he was related to some um, a namesake senator of his name from Missouri. And what he said was, the Marxist group of New York attacked my work, the work, as a form of chauvinism, as politically reactionary and isolationist. A question answer appearance on the meaning of the murals of the John Reed Club wound up in a chair throwing brawl. And I don't know if you know about the John Reed Club, but John Reed was an American who's buried in Red Square and a um, journalist pro uh, Soviet. So here you see ben, a detail of one of Benton's murals, one of his cycles, called Political Business and 
intellectual Bali Hu from 1932. Now, Bali Hu is an American expression. I don't know if it's much used in England or propaganda. And here's a detail, and I'd like to point out um, it makes fun literary playboys league for social consciousness, the Nation magazine, which is still today very left wing. And look on the blue background on the right, it, it mentions um, the new woman. That's the liberated woman. And um, from Edward Hopper to Benton, they've had no uh, acceptance of that. Um, so you get the idea. This is what Lee Krasner was up against. And Benson also played music, and one of his musical friends was one of his students of the Art Students League, and there's the guy playing the mouth harp, the harmonica, and that's the guy we're not letting take over this lecture, Jackson Pollock. So this is the moment of, of liberation of the Harlem Renaissance. We see um, the African-American woman artist, Lois Malloy Jones, the of Ethiopia from 1932. So cultural identity is very important in Harlem, in uptown Manhattan, in literature, visual arts, music, especially jazz. And we would go uptown to jazz clubs dancing. More about that in a minute. So you're just some Harlem. Langston Hughes was a leading poet. And it's the Great Depression. And all over our bread lines, who's out of work? Writers, artists. There was no art market. I mean, you saw in the early 30s, the Met was still buying, the Whitney was still buying. If they were buying Edward Hopper, they weren't buying the avant-garde, or the future avant-garde, or the young artists. There were no patrons, no jobs, no money, no meals. The artists were totally miserable, and Roosevelt took note that this was not going to be good for his administration. So he invented, he and his colleagues, the New Deal, and this was going to give jobs, um, minimum wage jobs, minimum, minimum wage. Uh, it was like under $100 a month, which wasn't that much even then, to out of work artists, writers, dramatists, playwrights, teacher, teachers of art. Um, still, the left-wing um, communists demonstrated against it. In 33, it wasn't um, enough. And here you see there were many parts. The WPA is the Works Progress Administration. That's the one that Lee, Igor, Pollock, de Kooning and many other artists were on. The trouble is, if you were on it 18 months, or like de Kooning, if you were turned out to be foreign born, you got thrown off. And then how were you going to live? You didn't even have that basic. But Lee, who said, to get on the WPA, you had to qualify for relief first. Relief is government charity. You had to prove that you had no visible means of support. So there's Lee, I think, in the foreground, working on the mural part of the project. There were easel projects, mural projects. <coughs> the head of her project was a Communist Party member. They, through the artist union, it's, it's ironic because it's US government, but they had more clout. So this guy was not much older than Lee, but he was better connected politically, Max Spivak. And so Lee was working as his research girl, he called her, on his library mural for a Queens library. And Harold Rosenberg, who wasn't even an artist, but could do sketch. <laughs> he got a job as the reader for Spivak. I don't know, they paid him to sit and read for Lee's research. But they were all working in various, or hanging out, like Lee was at Greenwich House doing her sketches when somebody came from the WPA recruiting people who were out of work. 
with the WPA. And Nicole Rosenberg was told, if you have anything, just bring it. You can get a job, anything you sketch. So the problem was um, and, um, they got thrown off often, so they made an artist union, a union, to protest uh, all the um, times that artists were thrown out of work and uh, looking out for artists' rights and also to try to get a little better wage. I mean, Lee would also demonstrate as part of the union, like for Warbex, which is a retail clothing store. I know she, she um, demonstrated to try to get the, the wage up from 10 cents an hour. So we're really talking very minimum wages. And she was on the um, artist committee there. But it, and Igor Panchenhop actually did modern art for the cover of several issues of the art front. And by the way, you can read in another recent book, which will go unnamed, that Igor had no interest in radical politics. It's certainly not true. The evidence is right in Lee Krasner's library. Books by Marx with his name in it um, that he left for her. Um, but he certainly flirted, even from his white Russian background, with Russian, um, with radical politics, left wing politics, and with modernism. And he was actually in a show at the Museum of Modern Art. And I think he was probably influenced by Lee Krasner's painting and by the Curico, who was being shown in New York. So this is Art Front Magazine in 1936. And here's um, another one of Igor's, I don't have it in color, now lost modernist paintings. He didn't stick with it, he got too discouraged. But you can see that he's very influenced by Giorgio de Chirico. In the meantime, so Lee's in all these demonstrations. There are parades on for May Day, there, there are Stuart Davis, um, and Lucien Bloch, who uh, was a Jewish American woman artist who worked for Diego Rivera in Mexico, for example. Um, so there was a lot of the Siqueiros who was running a workshop, the Mexican muralist in New York, the Mexican painter. So there was a lot of left wing agitation. And Lee was accused of being a Trotskyite at the Artists' Union when she spoke out. And she didn't even know at the time who Trotsky was. So she went out and got a book to read. And she found that Trotsky said something she agreed with. The national form of an art is identical with its universal accessibility. But Lee was not interested in making national art or accessible art. Um, and of course, Trotsky was thrown out, uh, exiled. But he wrote a book called The Revolution Betrayed. And he said the official formula reads, culture should be socialist in content, national in form. In any case, such prescriptions as portray the construction of the future, indicate the road to socialism, make over mankind, give a little more to the creative imagination than does the price list of a hardware store or a railroad timetable. So there were social realist artists. Besides, we've seen the uh, regionalists and the realists like Edward Hopper, but they were social realists, left-wingers making figurative art like uh, the dictates from Moscow, like William Gropper. And there was the New Masses magazine. We had no part in this. But she was very supportive of anti-fascist politics. She said, quote, around 1936, there was the Spanish Civil War, the clash of fascism and communism, 
theory, we were sympathetic to the Russian Revolution, the socialist ideas, as against the fascist ones, naturally. Then came complications like Stalinism being the betrayal of the revolution. I, for one, didn't feel like I was purifying the world at all. No, I was just going about my business, and my business seemed to be in the direction of abstraction. And I will point out to you that for many of the abstract expressionists, it was a way to get away from the dictates of Moscow and Stalinist demands for social realism. Lee um, was very enthusiastic about Picasso's Guernica, that um, very important painting memorializing the Nazi attack on the Spanish town of Guernica on market day, which was shown, of course, in the World's Fair at the Spanish Pavilion, but then traveled to New York in May 1939 and was shown at the Valentine Gallery. Lee went in, she said it was so moving. She had to go out and walk around the block and go back just to be able to deal with it. And I think when you look at the little image in the show at the Barbican of the black and white, uh, the black and white board image, that might be a reference, abstract of course, but to the black and white of Gurkha. And a lot of her colleagues, to Kuning, of course, uh, and Pollock responded to Gurkha and painted black and white. So let's look a little bit more at Lee's work in the 30s. There you see um, probably a self-portrait in the bathtub with a view through, um, inspired by one of her favorite artists, Matisse. And um, the still life in the foreground. also related to Cezanne, but I think it has meaning. If we were in the 18th century and we see the broken pottery there, it's like the broken eggs. So remember, Lee comes from this Orthodox Jewish background. She's living with Igor. They're living as a couple, pretending to be married but not married. She's definitely lost her virginity. And like the woman, the farm girl with the broken eggs, it's, I think, a metaphor. She would have known this painting at the Metropolitan. And of course, Duchamp was making all kinds of dot up jokes that she also would have known about um, the bride stripped bare by the bachelor's even. And here's a little document. I couldn't believe that I found this. Um, Lee and Igor pretended to be married when they applied to go off to Yado, which is still an important artist colony. In 1934, they applied, and they actually signed their name in this letter, uh, Igor and Lenore Panjohov, and that really never existed. I mean, the letter exists, the concept existed, but the legal entity never existed. And by the time they got in, they couldn't afford to leave their jobs from the WPA. But when they applied, they didn't have jobs, and they were desperate for support. Here's Igor's portrait of Lee. And Igor's portrait of Lee's father. Her family considered her married to Igor, but his family, of course, refused to meet her. Igor even painted Joseph Krasner holding a Yiddish publication. I don't think he got the Yiddish quite right, but he tried. <laughs> Here you see Lee's still life, very um, much inspired by Matisse. And then let's talk about the fact, well, there's a magic realism show right now on at the tape, but this is magic realism in America. Um, and here's an example 
And then other Jewish artists from Russia, Peter Bloom, who's painting political magic realism uh, about Mussolini, called the Eternal City sometime around the Spanish Civil War. And Lee um, moves from painting a scene in New York, you see on the left, the end of Ward Street, is where the new Whitney Museum is downtown. And she has discovered surrealism before the big show at MoMA. And Gorky, of course, also knows about surrealism. Our show Gorky, um, one of the abstract expressions who didn't live very long, but was a friend of Lee's and of de Kooning. So Lee knew everybody of this generation. Alfred Barr Jr., the curator at MoMA, did this show on Cubism and Abstract Art. The First Artist Congress, Left Wing, takes place. Sacklin Benzetti are accused um, falsely, and Ben Sean, a social realist, depicts them already in 31. There's social realism among by Jews, even in Chicago. And Isaac Sawyer and Moses and uh, Rachel Sawyer, three brothers from Russia, are making social realism in New York. Lee will have none of it. She does respond to the show, Fantastic Art, Dada and Surrealism at the Museum of Modern Art, another one of Alfred Barr's most important projects. And so we can look at Nancy Ward Street as it looked in a photograph and realize just how much surrealism Lee's taken in. And here, after the show, you can see there was fantastic art, as well as data and surrealism. So, Odelon Redon seems to have been a source for Lee's surrealist composition, as well as Granville, a 19th century artist who repeats the eyes or Giorgio de Chirico, we've already seen Igor's interest in de Chirico. And just to point out, the male artists bonded together in groups like the 10. These are all Jewish male artists, Adolf Gottlieb and Mark Rothko, among the more famous future abstract expressionists. Ilya Bolotovsky, from her classmate of her school and others. She doesn't go for them. And she feels already the influence of the primary colors of Mondrian's work in the late 30s. She joins the school where Igor Pantroff has been studying, which is run by Hans Hoffman. Let's get that. And um, he wants it in New York on, um, in the village in the winter. and in the summer in Provincetown at the beach. And there you see Igor and Lee. She was obviously having a good time and not, um, not very inhibited. And there they are in Provincetown with friends. There he is with one of the models. He was a bit of a womanizer. But his parents were putting a lot of pressure to get him to move where they moved to Florida and to become a society portrait painter. When he got thrown off the WPA, and so did Lee, they had no money. They couldn't even get money to eat. They sold their record player. There wasn't much. He, he just gave up. And this is what he sent to Lee, this postcard from Florida, asking her to, he left in the middle of the night, he wanted her to ship his belongings after 10 years, can you imagine? And look at the tree. It's kind of a comment, it's not just a palm tree. Um, but there he is in Palm Beach, and it says, the large plant that you have does not like the sun. It must have shade to exist. Well, here is Lee's work from, it's actually from about 19 39, uh, compared to Picasso and Gorky, there we go, that's the right date, um, mural study that she does for the WPA. 
And she puts this quote famously from Arthur Rimbaud on the wall, kind of protesting what she's experienced with Igor. She joins the American Abstract Artist, which has two honorary vice presidents, Vernon Lachey and Pete Gombrian, both of whom were present in New York. She exhibits with a lot of men and women in this group. Remember, women were pretty near equal for the first time in the WPA. Uh, this is at Ryan Hart's design for a demonstration at MoMA in 1940. Um, some of the women artists, I'll say that. Uh, Lee's mosaic collage, which I think must have been influenced by Mondrian's Broadway Boogie Woogie. Um, he took a shine to Lee and to her artwork, and he told her, you have great rhythm, never lose it. That's another one from Mural Studies. Uh, you have a very strong inner rhythm, never lose it. That's in 41. In January 42, she gets this invitation from John Graham, a white Russian immigrant. His real name was Ivan Dabrowski. He was the curator and, uh, for a show called Ameri French and American Paintings. And there was one unknown, one artist unknown to the professor in the show, and that was a guy named Jackson Pollock. She went to look him up on 8th Street, near, lived nearby. She was bowled over by his painting. This is his painting that was in that show, and a similar one to her painting, now lost, that was in the show. And, as they say, the rest is history, and I'll have to catch you up on that if you can come on Thursday. Thank you.